from a 7-6 2012 that was just lined with all sorts of last second, very close losses. Michigan State put it all together, paired that defense and that running attack actually with a passing game in the latter half of 2013, and voila, proved to be one of the best teams in college football, winning the Rose Bowl and finishing 13-1. and So we dive into Michigan State spring football. The Spartans just uh, hit the field on March 25th. And we do so with Brian Lee of Bleacher Report. Brian, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Mark. All right, so Michigan State, yes, they go from a team that is just going to slug it out on the ground, run the football, play exceptional defense, to a team that actually found a passing game, a viable passing game, again, in the latter half of 2013. And, and the guy that gets credit for that, rightfully so, is Connor Cook. We saw him in the Rose Bowl bounce back from a, an atrocious decision uh, trying to set up a screen pass and throw the interception, and he bounced back to play an exceptional second half throw for 300 yards. So your thoughts about Connor Cook, Andrew Maxwell has moved on, so it's Cook's job, but there seem to be some places, uh, some pieces behind Connor Cook uh, that, look, uh, that look for a bright future for Michigan State in the passing game. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, good riddance to Andrew Maxwell in East Lansing. Uh, but yeah, Connor Cook, he, he, he proved he plays his best on the big stage, I think, which, you know, sounds a little trite, but it's the, the truth with him, because his two best games of the season were against Ohio State in the Big Ten Championship game, were in the Rose Bowl in Pasadena against uh, a really good Stanford defense. Um, and that's, that's something to build on, and he's trying to build on that momentum. I worked with George Whit Whitfield this summer out in San Diego, uh, I listened to a podcast with Bruce Feldman of CBS Sports who said who really, he really stood out of everyone at that camp as someone who looked really good, really improved this offseason. Um, and that's why there's still a lot of optimism in East Lansing that 13-1 that and one was uh, not the exception but the rule because we have a real quarterback again. Yeah, and if you didn't watch the games, you would still think, okay, well, he didn't turn over the ball. He was a game manager. But that guy can drop back in the pocket and let her rip kind of <coughs> can really throw the football and did an exceptional job. So if he gets better, then really look out uh, for the Michigan State offense to actually uh, balance out uh, the efforts on the defensive side of the football. Another guy who came out of nowhere to a certain extent, he was definitely in the mix for the running back job was Jeremy Langford, but now we're talking about one of the top five to ten running backs in college football, just looking at productivity, not necessarily talent, but productivity, ran for 18 touchdowns. But I think the less than five yard per average tells you all you need to know about Jeremy Langford. He's going to move the sticks, get the tough yards. He's definitely a Mark D'Antonio back. So set up the uh, the running back situation for us. Yeah, it's exactly what you said. It's Langford is the prototypical uh, Dan, he's almost a microcosm of, of Mark D'Antonio's system where he grinds you down throughout the game. There were so many games last year where he was averaging even less than five. He was averaging three, 3.5 3 through, you know, the first three and a half quarters. And he kind of set up this formula where, you know, towards the end when they needed to ice the game, he would come up with a 35-yard run for a touchdown pretty much every time. He gets better as the game goes on, as the defense gets more tired. Uh, and I think that's why D'Antonio likes him so much and why he could be set up for a great season this year. Brian, I pounded this receiving core time and time again. Deplorable 2012. We're talking about just repeatedly dropping passes, dropping wide open receptions that would have moved the sticks, not competing for the football. And I know D'Antonio talked about it countless times. He was really annoyed at these wide receivers that they just didn't fight and compete. Uh, he, he said at times, I don't know what else to do. I've thought of every drill to improve the concentration on the football, and they're not responding, and so went 2012. 2013 started. We saw some improvement, but much of the same. But at the end of the year, no, they're not going to necessarily make us uh, forget, uh, I don't know, the uh, greatest show on turf or anything like that. But at the same time, guys like Tony Lippett stepped up, and Aaron Burbridge, uh, McGarrett Kings Jr. turned out to be kind of a big play threat. Uh, they lose Benny Fowler, who could find himself in the NFL. He, he performed pretty well at the Combine and elsewhere. So your thoughts about the Michigan State wide receiver core? 
Yeah, it was kind of jarring towards the end of the season. To we were so used to seeing the Michigan State quarterback drop back and throw into double coverage. It was it was weird to see people actually open towards the end of the year. Uh, but they really did get better. I, I I wouldn't call them great. I might not even call them good quite yet. But they're above average. They're they're in the top half of the Big Ten now, which I'd say is a really good thing. Uh, like you said, Lippitt was playing really well. Uh, McGarrett Kings did really well in the slot for most of the year. And they've got a couple guys in Aaron Burbridge and uh, DeAnthony Arnett, who's the kid who transferred from, uh, from Tennessee a couple years ago. But a great freshman season at Tennessee, came in, couldn't really get it going, took a red shirt last year, and everyone on the scout team said was raving about him all offseason. Um, if someone like him or Burbridge could come up and compliment Lippitt and Mumphrey and McGarrett Kings, uh, this receiving core could, could be one of the better ones in the Big Ten and as it's always one of their weaknesses, or at least it has been the past couple years, that would be scary for the rest of the conference. Now, Michigan State, in the time that I've been watching college football, which I don't really care to admit how long that's been, has been winning like six, seven football games almost repeatedly forever, regardless of who's been the coach, and we include Nick Saban. <laughs> Every so often they'll jump out and win nine or ten games. But basically, if you look at Michigan State football on through the 80s, the 90s, most of the 2000s, Six, seven wins all the time, minor bowl appearances. That's the stamp of the program. Mark D'Antonio comes in, gets things rolling, and not necessarily from a recruiting standpoint, if you're a recruiting geek and look at the rankings, but in terms of building a program, actually selling his brand of football to a group of players and producing one of the hardest, toughest most physical and tough-minded teams out there, and now we see a Michigan State team that not just this one season being an aberration, but winning a bowl game against Georgia. I would say the 7-6 and six campaign was an aberration. They lost a lot of close games right at the end of the, the, those uh, contests. That Michigan State has kind of established itself despite not recruiting the top-end players. So how does Mark D'Antonio do it? Um... I, I don't think he cares so much about the top-end players as much as he cares about the players who fit his style, who, who fit what he wants to make Michigan State football. Um, I really do believe that, that he'd almost rather have a couple, you know, three-star, maybe even a two-star in there, who feels like they were overlooked, who'll play angry. As long as he's big, as long as he's physical, D'Antonio owns his identity. Um, and so does Pat Narduzzi, of course, on, on, on the defense. And I think in terms of, of changing the culture of the program, making it consistently the 10-win school instead of the 6 or 7, I think the raises he and Narduzzi got this offseason speak largely to that. They, they see that this is their opportunity to finally become a Big Ten power, and I think they've got the right man for the job. Right, Brian, we appreciate the information and the insight. It's uh, Brian Lee. He writes for Bleacher Report. Please check out uh, his uh, writing there. He's uh, all over college football from coast to coast. Uh, Brian, of course, we're going to talk Michigan State defense because you can't talk Sparty unless you talk defense, so we're going to bring you back and talk some Michigan State defense. So thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me.